to the Climate Change Committee interview series fifth episode. This interview series is run by the Climate Change Committee, a club based in Massachusetts dedicated to spreading awareness about climate change. You can find our interviews on our YouTube channel and on any podcast platform. I am Delara. And I am Anjali. And we are today's hosts. Today we are meeting with Rishya Narayanan, the Climate Change Communications Manager at Mass Audubon and founder of the organization Professionals of Color in the Environment. She uses her leadership position to implement climate change education, develop climate change communications, and to increase the accessibility of these organizations. She holds high standards and is currently working towards Massachusetts having net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050. Uh, Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, As you mentioned, I'm Mass Audubon's Climate Change Communications Manager. Um, And a a little bit of a correction, I'm one of the co-founders of Posse Professionals of Color in the Environment. Um, And there are there are a couple of us. Uh, It's a really great organization. Um, So what I do and what I've been doing throughout my career is I've been using solutions and values focused language to mobilize broad audiences towards acting on some of our greatest environmental threats of our time. Um, So that has ranged from protecting our oceans and our marine life to now where I am advocating for uh, climate action so that we can protect a safe and healthy future for both people and for wildlife. Um, So I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Um, We'll start off with a pretty easy question. What do you like to do in your daily life to help fight, fight climate change? This is a great question uh, because I know that climate change is my job, um, but I also try and take action where I can outside of my job. And one of the kind of best ways I've found to do so, ironically aligned with my career in communications, is to talk about it. Um, A lot of Americans don't talk about climate change. Uh, The Yale Program on Climate Change Communications, I believe in their 2019 report, so the the statistic might have changed a little bit since then, but in their uh, 2019 report said over half of Americans say they rarely or never talk about climate change with their friends, their family, their acquaintances. Um, So just starting the conversation is something that I love to try and do. Uh, Throw in little tidbits with my friends, you know, when we're chatting. Um, or engage in those conversations with my family members who are kind of all over the state uh, right now and all over the country right now. Um, So talking about it, it's as easy as starting with the conversation. All right, this is also kind of a fun question, but what's your favorite green activity? Yes, definitely a fun question. I have fallen in love with gardening. Um, and I started indoors <laughs> with house plants, um, and I'm now slowly kind of exploring gardening outdoors um, in my condo complex right now. Uh, I've been digging into things like uh, what native plants are, what pollinator friendly plants are, um, and it's a fun little way for me to kind of reconnect with the earth um, while we're all kind of stuck inside a little bit more than we're used to <laughs> reconnect with the earth and and you know, do my part in, in supporting the environment in a small way. Do you grow your own food right now or is it just like plants? I tried to, I had a brief uh, stint with basil and mint that and they amazing. both started off really well and then they both died very quickly. So I'm, I'm gonna move, I'm moving over to florals right now. <laughs> oh, very Hopefully they give me better luck. Um, so we're both in high school. So we were wondering like, how did you choose your career path or like, what classes would you recommend people take in order to get where you are right now? I think that's a fabulous question to be thinking about, especially when you're in high school, you're kind of approaching this next step as well of what are we going to do next? Are we going to college? Are we going to vocational school? Whatever, whatever that next step is. Um, I would say think intersectionally. I think that is one of the most beautiful advantages that our next generations have is that nothing is just in one sector. And so if you have a passion, there's a way to combine passion with academic experience, with curiosities. Um, And so in choosing this career path, I kind of looked at what I loved and I loved the environment, but I didn't go to school to be a scientist. And in high school, honestly, I was told that I was really bad at science and that Maybe that wasn't the right path for me. Um, So I kind of 
you know, I did an audit of my skills. I did an audit of what I loved. I was good at reaching out to people and I loved talking to people, but I also had this connection with the environment. You know, I was that kid in the Camden Aquarium in New Jersey, um, where I'm from, with her face pressed up against the glass, looking at all the fish, you know, the, the African penguin exhibit. That was me, that was every weekend. Um, and it took a little bit of time to realize that there was a way to connect all of those passions and experiences together. And I, I, I do wish I had known that sooner. I wish I had learned that sooner. So I would say, um, in high school, just think about how to combine everything and think about exploring. This is your time, right? Climate communications when I was in high school, didn't even know that existed, right? Science communications, didn't even know that existed. So um, yeah, it's your time to put your feelers out there. All right, so you seem to be really passionate about telling stories about climate change and just advocating against it. So why is it important to you to tell stories about this and just fighting climate change in general? When we look at how to move people towards action on something that's really important, like climate change, we quickly realize that numbers don't work. Numbers don't inspire people to act. Numbers can be scary. They can make us feel something. You know, Maybe they can make us feel that something is important. But at the end of the day, that is not what we can use to get large groups of people acting on a crisis like climate change, on an issue like climate change. And so the value of storytelling is that it adds emotion to numbers and it puts faces and experiences and values to those numbers. And with stories, we can take something big and global and sometimes kind of fuzzy like climate change and complicated, and we can bring it home. So we can tell stories about climate change in Massachusetts, things that people can see every day right now <laughs> in their communities, in their backyards, in their towns, at their favorite trails or parks. We can take this global issue, we can take these big numbers, or sometimes small, but actually really big, right? Like a 1.5 degree Celsius warming might not seem that big to people, but it's actually really big. And we can drive the message home through storytelling. So on your journey of finding your voice, like what was it like and how would you like use it in the means for change? This is an interesting question because as a storyteller, you kind of have to think about your role in communicating experiences. So I am a woman of color, um, but my experience in climate change doesn't reflect everyone's experiences in climate change. And we see how different identities, different communities are affected differently by this environmental threat. And so throughout my professional career, I've really sat with ethical storytelling and where my voice can be used to amplify a movement and where my platform can be used to empower undervalued or overshadowed voices. How can we provide not just equity, but justice through communications? And, you know, I, I was talking to one of my colleagues, Nia Keith, who's Mass Audubon's climate change education manager. We were kind of navigating these different roles that um, you can take as a storyteller, right? So you can take the role of the actual storyteller or the narrator. You can explain an experience through your words, uh, and it might be someone else's experience. But are we really empowering other people through our role and through our platform if it's not our story? There's the role of the interviewer where, you know, kind of like you two are doing, you can talk directly to people, right? Grab direct quotes and frame a narrative within your own words. And that's kind of a step closer to, to being ethical with storytelling and, and not only finding your own voice, but empowering other voices. And then there's also first person narratives. So being able to say, I have the privilege of working at a nonprofit conservation organization, a pretty, a pretty large one. You know, how can we empower voices to tell their own stories and use our platform to uplift these voices? So, you know, we've started 
a climate champion series at Mass Audubon, which is all first person narratives about why, why did this person act on climate? Why do they care? And what gives them hope? So it's a complicated journey, finding your own connection to climate change, but also finding your connection to this kind of larger picture communications where climate change touches everyone. Um, how do we navigate how to tell those stories in an ethical way um, so that we are also doing our role to empower and uplift? Um, just a follow up question. Is storytelling like something you grew up with when you were little, like in your family? Or do you want to talk about that a little bit? That's an awesome question. Um, my mother loved books. Uh, she always wanted to get me reading as much as I could. Um, and then pretty soon, I would say <laughs> I ditched the books when I was your age in high school and I went to video games, much to her chagrin, which was still a form of storytelling, I say to this day. Um, so narratives have always fascinated me. I don't think I've, it wasn't until I graduated from undergraduate studies that I realized that, you know, these stories can be used for more than just, it's more than just entertainment, right? It transcends, um, kind of escaping reality into a fantastical narrative for a little bit. Um, it can be much more motivational and kind of the things that drew me towards stories, both when I was reading books and also playing video games, um, the kind of appeal to emotion uh, still stands true to this day um, with my work. So, I mean, I'm sure my mom would love to hear that she inspired my career <laughs> through her love of books. Um, but I, I will say that I think narratives have, have always been a part of my life. Uh, it just wasn't formalized until, until I graduated my undergraduate studies. All right. So what advice would you give students and just young adults our age um, who want to follow a similar career path as yours? As I said earlier, think intersectionally. If you love science and you love writing, those two things don't need to contradict. If you love history, but you also love, I'm not sure, uh, algebra, those two things don't need to you know, contradict. Every skill can be combined. And that's, I think, such a beauty of today's workplace is nothing is isolated in one sector. Um, and so the advice I would give uh, if you're in high school, even if you're younger, if you're in middle school, again, is follow your passions and try new things. Um, the other piece of advice I would give is don't let people tell you that you're bad at something. Um, your skill, what makes you successful is ambition and passion. And if you wanna succeed, if you wanna do well, if you have the goals, to really, you know, hit something hard, you're gonna do well, you're gonna be successful. Uh, don't let other people tell you, you know, oh, maybe you're not cut out for this, that you're not really good at this. Follow your heart. And as long as you have drive and ambition, you're going to succeed. I think if I heard those two pieces of advice when I was in high school, um, I had this dream of becoming an ornithologist when I was much younger. And if I heard this advice in high school biology, uh, I maybe I wouldn't be an ornithologist, but maybe I would be a little bit closer to the sciences um, earlier on. So there's a world to explore and exploration can feel intimidating. And there are a lot of choices that you have to make throughout high school, throughout college, throughout middle school. Um, but try to keep curiosity and remember to keep your ambition and Remember that success comes from drive. Okay, so fast forwarding a little bit in your life, um, what role did your undergraduate and non-climate related studies play in your life and ultimately your career choice? So I pursued a degree in psychology and sociology uh, for undergrad at Clark University. Um, and when I first started my program, I was determined to become a psychiatrist and go to med school. Uh, you can tell that didn't pan out uh, <laughs> based on my career right now. Um, I quickly realized it just wasn't the path that I wanted to pursue. Uh, but psychology and sociology still really appealed to me because of its connection to people. Um, and so after I realized that med school was not for baby Rish, um, I started to dive deeper through my coursework, uh, looking into um, how people understand the world around them and interact with the world around them. And that ranged from um, digesting messages 
and the internal kind of subjective process of meaning making to also looking at the cultural reproduction of certain things, you know, like, uh, for example, like marginalization of certain groups um, and how identity really affects a person's mental experience, physical experience, health outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of that lent itself really well <laughs> to a career in communications, which again, kind of exemplifies that you have to think intersectionally when you when you are thinking about your future, because psychology and sociology may not seem so directly connected to communications, but it's provided just such a fabulous foundation for me to think about how my messages are touching people, to think about how my messages and the values that I imbue within them might reach to certain audiences, but might not reach to other audiences. So that has played a huge part um, in helping me realize not only that I, I really love connecting with people, but also that there's a career in this and I could use that skill, those skills for that career. Okay, so going back to spreading awareness about climate change through storytelling, we were wondering who your main audiences are and how do you appeal to them? That's a good question. My audiences have varied throughout my career. Um, they have been very, very local, like towns and communities. They've been much more regional, like the entirety of Massachusetts. They've been global, right, from visitors from all around the world. Um, our audiences have been local elected officials. They've been people who are specifically and consistently taking action that we know we can activate and mobilize. Um, and the kind of key tenets I take with me when I'm appealing to different audiences is doing what we call audience segmentation, which is taking a big group and splitting them up into different groups based on one kind of unique factor among all the groups. So an example that I apply in my daily work would be segmenting audiences based on objects of care, which is like a really fancy way of saying what they value, right? So it doesn't have to be objects. It can be things like um, hiking. It could be things like access to nature, uh, or it can be like an animal or a plant. <laughs> so when I want to appeal to multiple audiences, one way I segment them is by thinking about those objects of care. Okay, we have a group that cares about birds. We need to encourage our audiences to act on climate. Let's create a message that talks about the benefits of climate action on birds, right? Okay, we have an audience that cares about public health. They really care about the safety of their community. They're experiencing flooding almost every other weekend because of extreme rain events. They're also experiencing extreme heat. We need to use a public health object of care lens to talk about why climate action is so important and how that benefits our community's health and human resilience. Well, this is a question more about your experience at the New England Aquarium and how you were interested in marine life, but just what interests you most about marine life, that's all. It's so weird. <laughs> marine life is so weird. Have you ever looked at deep sea creatures? They're fascinating. <laughs> Uh, they can they can light up. They have these weird anatomical features. I feel like marine life is when I think of nature and its wonders. I think of marine life as this like mystical mystery, um, and I love uncovering more. And I love exploring just how much you know the oceans hold, especially because it covers most of our planet, and we know so little about it. So uh, I love I love the challenge of learning new things every day. I love looking at weird little critters I never knew existed <laughs> and thinking about their importance. Um, I, I just think marine life is so exciting. This is kind of a follow-up question to Anjali's question, but what would you say is like the most fascinating fact or idea about marine life? One of the things that blew my mind when I was working at the New England Aquarium is there's a species of fish called the Bengay cardinal fish. And the male Bengay cardinal fish, after you know, after they've the, a pair has had um, eggs, will hold them in its mouth. It's called mouth brooding, uh, and kind of parent in that way instead of just like leaving the eggs alone and swimming away. Um, so I don't know if that's the most fascinating fact, but it's always stuck with me, and I've always kind of remembered that <laughs> uh, throughout 
my time since, since the New England Aquarium. And I think there's so many other little fun tidbits just like that about marine, marine life that I find so exciting. I'm a nerd though, so <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I find really exciting. <laughs> Uh, we all are a little bit, don't worry. <laughs> but um, shifting our focus to our audience, what can people do in their daily lives to help reduce their carbon footprint? This is a this is a really cool question you asked, and I I, I might kind of flip it a little bit because there are a lot of things that we can do to start acting on climate. Um, but you know, at the end of the day real impact and real scale comes from working together. Um, so if, you know, if you're just starting out with climate action, you want to make a difference and you don't think you've ever done it before. There are things you can do like, you know, eating plant-based meals, you know, gardening, planting a tree. Um, but then as you kind of continue with climate action, you get a little bit more comfortable with it. You know, you planted your tree, you ate your plant-based meal, whatever it might be. Starting to think as a community, as a collective, is where sizable impact comes from. So for me, right, instead of just thinking about how I can compost, I was looking at, uh, when I was living in Boston, the City of Boston's Project Oscar program, which is a citywide composting program, right? So coming together as a city to dedicate, dedicate ourselves to this initiative of composting together. So individual actions are great. They're a great starting point. But I always encourage the people I talk to to think bigger picture. And while that might feel scary because it might feel like a lot of additional responsibility, I channel my inner high school musical and I say, we're all in this together, right? We all have a role, yep, exactly. <laughs> we all have a role to play. And when we work together, we can make that impact that, that we need to tackle a problem as big as climate change. All right, so besides reducing their carbon footprint, what can people do to help endangered animals and essentially all wildlife? Getting to the roots of climate change, which means mitigating climate change or reducing our current emissions and eliminating them and also removing their current emissions from the atmosphere. It might seem disconnected, but it's actually a really great way to help out wildlife, threatened species. Climate change is what we call a threat multiplier. Um, it takes these existing stressors, things like deforestation, um, things like pollution, and it tends to aggravate them and make them a lot harder to deal with, especially for threatened or vulnerable species. And so by, again, working collectively to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, it's a great way to help out wildlife. Okay, so what is something most people don't know about climate change or something that really like surprised you when you found out about climate change? This is why I say individual action is great, but we need to work as a collective. I found out a year or two ago, I was reading this article on The Guardian. Um, it was a report in 2017, and it found that just 100 corporations are responsible for 71% of the world's global emissions. Just 100 corporations, right? And so when you look at the history of climate change, and when you look at Who's really responsible for historical emissions and our current global emissions? It really reframes the narrative of how we can act on climate and the scale in which we need to act on climate. Um, so <laughs> this fact, it blew my mind. It was kind of a, a game changer for me and how I operate. Um, and it reinforced the idea that while we should all work together and while individual actions are a great entry point, it really is at the end of the day, making sizable impact. All right, um, you kind of touched on this earlier, but what are some easy things people can do in their daily lives to just fight climate change in their community? Um, so I, said this in the beginning, it's what my favorite activity is when it comes to fighting climate change, talking about it. Just get the conversation started, right? Find an avenue in your local community where you can ignite these conversations and spark inspiration and hope. Not only that, where you can also work to bring home such a global issue. There are a plethora of resources in our communities, right? Libraries are one of my favorites. And Libraries are great forums for learning, for discussion, and also action. 
right? So maybe those conversations can be hosted in your library, at your local cafe, whatever it might be. Um, you know, at Mass Audubon, we have climate cafes, judgment-free forums for conversation. They're happening virtually right now. Um, get the conversation started. Well, I'm really glad we were able to have this conversation because I definitely learned a lot. Um, is there anything you want to leave our audience with or anything you want to talk about going on in your own life that you think they would benefit from? And then that'll be our last question. No, you know, I think that remembering to think as a community and remembering that no matter who you are, how old you are, where you come from, you can act on climate and you can make a difference and your voice matters. Um, I think those are the most important things. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for doing this. Um...